Hello, Moto. All right, me and Gabrielle have come up with new creepypas to story ideas around the campfire. And Harry, do you agree with Redding Blue's clues creepypas to stories around the campfire? We know it's your younger brother Mikey's favorite show. Yes, Mr. Martinson, I agree with reading those scary stories. And Harry, thank you for bringing your friends Rocket, Molly, and Kenny along for the ride. And I brought my girlfriend Gabrielle, my friends Trickshot and Pocket, and Miss Matson along with me to read those scary stories regarding your younger brother Mikey's favorite show. Okay, I start off, and the others continue by reading another portion. That's how the activity goes. Let's begin. To protect my privacy, I have decided to keep my name anonymous. I'm not sure how to begin my story, but I'll do the best I can. I guess I'll start by informing you about the show Blue's Clues. Gabrielle, you continue. For those of you who have never watched it, Blue's Clues is a show for young children that was created in 1996, and lasted for 10 years with a total of 6 seasons and 141 episodes. This show involves Steve or Joe looking for clues and solving mysteries with help from the audience. Blue is an animated dog who labeled the clues with her paw prints. Blue's Clues was a hit with many little kids, including me. The idea was original, and the artwork was amazing. However, Steve Burns was the backbone of the show. Steve Burns was the actor who played Steve. He was more serious than Barney the Dinosaur, but he loved kids and knew exactly how to make them happy. There was just something magical about his enthusiasm that made me want to watch more and more of his episodes. He sadly left the show in 2002, and pursued a musical career. Steve was replaced by Donovan Patton, who was the actor for Joe, but it wasn't the same. I stopped watching Blue's Clues after Steve left. The show just lost its magic for me. Joe was nothing like Steve. He was a total goofball, and my mother told me that Donovan Patton was acting too hard. When I was 16, my family moved to a large three-story house in upstate New York that was previously owned by a nice old lady. A few days after moving in, I decided to do some exploring in the attic. I found an old box. To my surprise, it was filled with a bunch of old VHS tapes. All of them were Blue's Clues tapes. I knew the old lady's cell phone number, so I decided to call her and ask her about the tapes. She told me that she bought them from a collector a few years back for her little grandson to watch. After I thanked her and hung up, I emptied the box before checking the tapes. All of them had episodes that I had already watched, except for one. The one tape I found just had a regular sticker, not a factory sticker like the other tapes had. The title on the sticker was, Blue's Clues, Sorrow. I thought the title was a little strange, but I figured it was just a copy of the Steve Goes to College episode, the one where Steve goes off to college and Joe takes his place. Because Steve said goodbye to all of his friends in that episode, I considered it to be very sorrowful indeed. When my parents went on their anniversary trip and left me in charge of the house one night, I figured it was the perfect opportunity to check out the tape. Our TV has a VCR, and I have to admit, I felt a tingle of excitement when I placed the tape in the player. I was about to relive my childhood memories of watching Blue's Clues. I didn't care that I was too old to watch it. I knew for sure that I would enjoy it. At least, that's what I thought. The episode started off with the usual opening sequence. The Blue's Clues book opened up, and Steve looks out a window of the little yellow house and said a variant of his usual season 4 opening phrase. Hi. It's me, Steve. Is that you? It is? Great. Could you help me find Blue? Wait, she's not here. Well, come on in the front door opened, and Steve was in the living room, looking concerned. I need to tell you something important. Blue is at the vet, and she's having an operation on her heart, I, hope she's okay. Steve stopped talking and looked down at the floor. The scene ended. It cut to a scene where Steve was on the phone. We then hear a woman's voice saying the following, her heart stopped beating. We tried our best, but we couldn't get it to beat again. I'm sorry. The scene ended. The next scene started with a title card saying that a month had passed after Blue's funeral. A deep voice spoke. There are five stages in the grieving process. 
denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, the voice said. Steve will experience three stages all at once, depression, anger, and mental illness. Steve was in his bedroom, lying in bed. He began to cry, and the color of the episode turned black and white, like a depressing old photograph. Steve cried so hard, his breathing grew shallow. The scene ended. The next scene showed Steve sitting up on his bed. He stopped crying, but his face was now red and his teeth were clenched tightly. Steve held his stuffed anteater, Horace, with both hands. He screamed B-L-L-L-L-U-U-U-E, at the top of his lungs. His scream sent chills down my spine. Steve ripped off Horace's head, and Black Hoose squirted out of the stuffed animal's neck. Steve threw Horace in a fit of rage. When the anteater landed, it soon completely covered the floor. I fought the urge to vomit. Against my better judgment, I decided to keep watching. Steve's body began to turn a darker and darker color by the second. After about five seconds, Steve turned completely black. He got up out of bed, walked out of the bedroom, and walked into his living room. I thought he was going to sit in the thinking chair, but he didn't. He stood in front of the chair, and stared at the screen for a full minute. His eyes lost their pupils, and became nothing more than white dots. He started crying again, and white tears streamed down his face, some sad piano music began to play. The music was so heartbreaking, I shed a few tears myself. A message flashed across the screen. It said, you can figure out lose clues, that you can't figure out insanity. The scene ended. The next scene showed Steve still standing in the living room. He was no longer crying, and his body was a completely normal color. I can't live without Blue, he said. She was my best friend. She gave my life happiness and meaning. Without her, I have nothing to live for. The kids in the background that helped Steve find the clues started to cry and whimper. They shouted, please don't do it Steve. We love you. We're your friends too. I'm sorry, Steve said. I'm sorry if I break your hearts for doing this, but I have no choice. Goodbye. He held up a container. The camera zoomed in on the label, which said, potassium cyanide. Steve had a calm look on his face as he swallowed the contents of the container. He instantly collapsed onto the carpet. He foamed at the mouth, while his body twitched and thrashed on the floor like he was being electrocuted. Steve eventually stopped moving and I knew that he was dead. The episode finally ended as my TV cut to static. I sat still, dazed. It took my brain a few minutes to comprehend what I had just watched. I made the decision then and there to play detective and find out where in the world this episode came from. I looked up the name of the episode online, but came up with nothing. I knew that the company Viacom owned Blue's Clues, because their company name was shown on the factory stickers of the other VHS tapes. After a bit of research, I wrote a letter to the Viacom headquarters. I told them about my experience, and asked them if they knew where the tape came from. Two weeks later, I got a reply in the mail. Dear Mr. XXXXX, thank you for taking the time to write to us. We were quite surprised by your story about the entered episode of Blue's Clues that you discovered. We are grateful that you contacted us concerning it. We can personally assure you that Viacom Media Networks as well as Viacom claims no ownership or liability whatsoever regarding the episode. However, we still feel that an explanation is in order. Unfortunately, we are unable to provide details of the tape's creation, as we simply don't know how this happened. Back in 2002, we received a VHS tape in a package with no return address. The words, Mr. Ted, were written on the package. Along with the tape, there was a letter from Mr. Ted stating that he was the biggest fan of the Blues Clue series and asked for our approval to air his fan-made creation on television. We were quite flattered that a fan would send us a fan-made episode for airing however, when our editors viewed the episode for refinement, they were quite appalled by its nature. A few of the staff who viewed the episode unbelievably went into shock and had to be transported to the emergency room immediately. Due to the horrifying content, we had absolutely no plans to air this episode. We passed the tape to a private collector, 
but we were dismayed to discover that he had many copies made. We ask that you please do not release the contents of the tape or this letter to the public, as we do not want to upset the viewers who love and support our shows for young children. With warm regards, Michael D. Frickless, Executive Vice President, General Counsel and Secretary. Questions bounced around inside my head, and they still do to this day. Who is Mr. Ted? How was he able to create this demonic episode? Is he even, well, human? Out of no respect for Viacom, I'm afraid I cannot provide any footage. However, I figured releasing a single screenshot and a copy of the letter to the public wouldn't make them too angry. You're probably wondering, why are you telling me this? What's the point of this story? To be honest, I just wanted to get it off my chest. I've kept it a secret for a little while, but I eventually felt the desire to tell someone, whether they believed me or not. A part of my brain told me to throw away the tape and the letter, but I have kept both in my closet to remind me that what I experienced was real. I now realize that some so-called fans of TV shows are not as normal as you might think they are. The End Harry, Rocket, Molly, and Kenny, all of you get ready for bed. We have to go fishing at the pier near Lake Michigan tomorrow near the United States-Canada border, where they have plenty of fish inside that great lake. Harry, your dad is calling you and your friends to your tent for bedtime. Hope to see you and your friends again soon. Till we meet again, Tailsland. Jenny, welcome back. And you brought Ashley, Dave, and Astro along for the ride. Ready for another. Jenny, I hope Ashley is okay for the second scary Blue's Clues story. She's all right, Tailsland. Besides, Dave loves scary stories, and so does Astro. Even Ashley couldn't stand a chance of getting the grease scared out of her. Okay, you know the activity rules. I read one portion, you continue the rest. Let's begin, shall we? You know, I always liked Blue's Clues. It was a show about a lonely man who lived in his apartment and seemed to have issues solving very simple dilemmas. He was guided by his dog, Blue, a blue dog. It's a great show with a lot of mentally stimulating material, but what a lot of people don't know is the various elements of the original plotline were stripped out in favor of more family-friendly entertainment. The pilot episode, created by Todd Kessler and whoever David Nill was, was an interesting take on the original idea, though maybe slightly more of in tone. Gabrielle, you go next. Steve, for example, is slightly blind. This is why he had his dog Blue, as seeing a dog was meant to help him find things. The clues were intended to be the dog trying to assist Steve in things like finding groceries and going to the bathroom. The episode starts slightly differently. Instead of the yellow book saying Blue's Clues opening, instead a book titled Disability Aid for Impaired Humans is shown. A picture of a skeleton man in a tuffet with a cane is on the cover. Indeed, the show looks a little different. The show used computer-generated stills to render its backdrops, but these stills were grainier and of lower quality. The yard looked fairly unkempt and dirty, for example. Another issue I noticed, which became more and more glaringly obvious as time progressed, was that Steve had two dark circles under his eyes. Indeed, Steve looked a little sick. Little did I know how sick Steve was. Steve was sick. Anyway, Steve was played by the same actor, but he was much slower. He had a speech impediment which made his words slightly slurry. Come on then. He huffed like droopy dog. Blue the dog also looked different. The skin was textured more like a real dog. While still blue, there were noticeably fur-like hairs on the character model, and the eyes sparkled like a real puppy dog's. In one regard it looked cute, but in another. It just seemed a little off. Steve's shirt was frail and tattered. The walls of the home were kind of dirty too, with fading wallpaper. Steve's usual sofa chair was dirtier. Some sort of stain was on it, it was hard to make out. Steve went to get the mail. He sang his usual song, but instead of lyrics, it was just the word mail over and over. Mail 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 mail. He stammered. He shuddered a little and almost fell over. Mail. He excitedly opened the mail to find nothing but a few bills and an expired coupon for a free Chick-fil-A sandwich. I don't know what I was expecting. Steve said with a scowl. I don't have any friends. There was a long pause. Except for you, kids. 
He pointed at the camera and smiled at the camera as it zoomed into his face, revealing a disheveled amount of beard stubble. I need something fun to do today. Steve exclaims. Blue is seen in the corner, tugging away at the corner of a rug. As Steve continues to talk, the rug is slowly pulled away more and more, revealing a trapdoor. A symbol of an eye is carved on the door along with the Latin phrase, Sicus Bardus, which roughly translates to, unintelligent blind man. Steve is visibly shaking as he adjusts his house's thermostat. The thermostat is a real thermostat, not a drawn-in one. In fact, many of the objects that would be drawn in are more like pasted on clip art. I need to clean myself. Steve says. He goes into his bathroom and begins to shower. Suddenly, the soap begins to scream. What the hell are you doing? The soap yells. Steve sees that the soap has a face, and while it's a cute smiley face, he looks really confused. He begins to freak out and throws the soap in the toilet, flushing it down while it screams bloody murder. He notices tiny faces on all of his other cosmetic and hygiene products. What's next, singing toothpaste? The voice said from the other room. I just imagined that. Steve said. Blue, he yelled. Help me find something fun to do. Blue winked at the camera and lead Steve into the kitchen area. I'll take your mouth too. A voice said from the other room again. Steve walked into his kitchen, which had a small fire burning in the corner. The utensil drawer was shaking. There were living utensils in there, he knew it. Steve bumped into the side of the table and fell down. Blue placed a paw print. The first clue. Sitting on the table behind Steve's corpse was a blue paw print on a cucumber. The first clue. Blue seemed slightly sinister looking. There were six copies of a slightly transparent blue sprite all layered over each other. Look. A voice yelled. What? Steve said. Right there. The voice yelled. What is it? It was the same thing it always was, a clue. And the clue was clearly visible, so why couldn't Steve see it? A strange figure in a cloak slid across the room without moving its legs. It may have been a prop on wheels, but whatever it was, it took several random items such as chairs and bowls as it made its rounds across the room. What is it? Steve said. The flames continue to eat the background. It's a clue. A grizzled, older man's voice yelled. How the hell can you not see that? It's right reeking there. Steve squinted, and picked up the cucumber. He opened up his notepad and tried to draw it, but he was shaking too much and ended up drawing something weird. I couldn't really tell what it was. It looked like a picture of Hitler at a children's birthday party. Steve was then led to the second clue, which again had the man yelling angrily. You can hear me, I know you can. Whispered that slithery voice from the other room. Steve needed another shower. He showered again and then found the second clue. It was a jar of Vaseline. He couldn't even draw this, it was just a straight line followed by the camera cutting back to him with one eye closed. A few seconds later Steve is seen on the phone with his doctor. I feel like my dog is trying to kill me. And all of the utensils, furniture and appliances in my house have faces. The phone is disconnected. Steve is shown walking over his door to lock it with great paranoia. He drags a huge deadbolt across the door and turns around to adjust a crooked picture of the room he's in on the wall. Look, the voice yelled. The third clue was on Steve's right butt cheek. Steve went over to the chair and began to deliberate on his clues. Hmm, he said. What is something I can do with a cucumber, Vaseline, and, he thought and thought about it. He asked the audience. He paced around the room. He tried desperately to comprehend what the clues added up to, but he couldn't. Blue suddenly began to talk in a heavy German accent. I want you to put the cucumber in your ass. Steve began to scream as the dog jumped forward, revealing rows and rows of teeth, like a trash compactor. Do it you umlaut. The teeth began to rotate in a machine-like fashion as Steve ran into the other room. The door was gone. He tried desperately to draw a new door with a crayon, but the fires from the kitchen had made the home so hot that the crayon melted into the wall. A bloodied wheelchair, covered in leeches lay in the corner. 
Blue's head elongated by a foot in length, and his eyes grew as wide as saucers now. Talon-like claws grew from his skin, and his or her rows of teeth began to grind up the backdrop. Steve's last hope was the trapdoor from earlier. He ran over to it and pulled it open, diving into it. Blue's monstrous teeth chittered as he began to sprout bony wings, and blood began to pool from beneath his feet. His stomach opens up and highly realistic gore begins to spew in mammoth chunks from everywhere. Massive columns of fire erupted from behind him as the walls cracked and broke. A strange hollow, soulless noise began to envelop the screen as demonic spikes slowly rose from the ground around him. I'm not blue. He boomed. I'm red. Two dozen dead bodies lay at the bottom of the trap door. Steve stumbled over them, his blindness not allowing him to realize what they were. The blood-red dog-like demon bit into Steve's arm, leaving a bloodied and gnarled mess. Steve reached across the floor and picked up a crowbar, and lifted it high, slamming it brutally into Blue's skull, cracking it into bloodied pieces. Blue, or red as he liked to be called, exploded, sending gore flying in all directions. Steve slammed against the wall and joined the pile of bodies that were laying face down on the floor. The center of the explosion had revealed Blue's true core. A little skeleton man in a top hat and a monocle began to dance around. He did all kinds of crazy dances with a sinister smile. As the skeletal man began to dance like Michigan J. Frog, a voice whispered, I'm in your home. I personally looked around my own home and saw nothing. The tape should have ended there. The credits to the children's program began to roll, but they were abruptly cut off by some random conversation between two people. This really is good pizza. One of them says. It's Steve. They say when you lose one sense, it heightens the others. Steve says. Hard to enjoy it. Steve continued, holding a spoon. There was nobody else there. He was having a conversation with the air at his dinner table. I wouldn't enjoy this as much if I had my eyes. Pause. He took my eyes. Steve screamed. The camera cut to Steve, with two abyss-like holes that were wider than normal eye sockets. Deep within his eye sockets, there was a nothingness as he sat there, and smiled, and enjoyed his pizza. He wasn't alone though. The shovels and pails, the salt and pepper shakers, the garbage cans and the refrigerators were all alive and well. The end. Say. Since this is our first time reading Blue's Clues scary stories, including the lost episode and sorrow ones, we all deserve a treat. I know, trick shot. Marshmallows are my favorite kind of sugary goodness, and so is Jenny's and Ashley's. Right, girls? Right. Right. While waiting for the marshmallows to be toasted, let's end the video for now. Bye. Never give up! Trust your instincts! Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more. Goodbye.